Well, greetings and welcome to another edition of the Psych Monologues. I am Dr. Ray Mitz, your host. And now that uh, Thanksgiving is in the rearview mirror, we are teeing up the last push to the end of the year and into the holiday season as well. Uh, so I, I, in spite of the fact, this feels a little weird because I'm, I'm recording this before Thanksgiving in an effort just to uh, uh, allow myself some wiggle room on the backside going into uh, the last weeks of the semester and also finals week. But I do want to apologize for uh, being absent for the last couple of weeks. I haven't uh, checked in and done a podcast for a little bit of time. I think I mentioned in the last episode when I was talking about When Life Intrudes that we were heading off to visit with my father-in-law, Dr. Paul Williams. And uh, just to give you a quick recap, it was a good visit, but a hard visit. Uh, we we took the time to uh, get him situated into a new living, uh, assisted living situation. And he was still really kind of uh, adjusting to his new uh, digs and the way things were there and the people that would be waiting on him hand and foot, which for somebody as independent as him, uh, it that is not always a pleasant experience at all. So but I think in, in later episodes, I may take some time to unpack a little bit of our parting because it, it, my effort in, um, in going and spending some time with him, even with the most mundane tasks and being in his world, seeing him interact with people, uh, but the mundane tasks of setting up a, a, a cable modem and his TV and all the other things, as mundane as they were, uh, time becomes more and more precious as you begin to approach the the end. You, suddenly these things have even more meaning than they did before because we our tendency, my tendency certainly, is to take them for granted. I will get more. And in, in as, as you interact with somebody who uh, is coming toward the end of their life, suddenly these these moments you want to relish and savor and remember and that was every bit the same way um, as we spent time there with him and we had our uh, goodbye at the end and it was it was a sweet but hard as you've no doubt noticed and heard before the whole idea of bitter sweetness it was both of those things and and uh, hard to turn turn and uh, return to uh, reality, although that that's a different kind of reality. So there will be more on that at a later point in time. I I, I think going into the holidays, uh, you know, as the old song goes, "Home for the holidays" is is uh, sometimes not always pleasant, and so I I may be exploring a few of those issues as well. Um, so that's that's the the quick recap and and. Uh, debrief for our time away, my time away. So just by way of introduction for those of you who are wondering what you got yourself into and listening to uh, this podcast, uh, the Psych Monologues as a podcast is is devoted to exploring the intersection of faith, uh, psychology, and spiritual formation, and, and really landing and talking about what the journey actually looks like rather than the destination we're trying to achieve. Now, that doesn't mean we don't have intermediate destinations along the way. We, Of course, we do. But at the same time, that's what this is for. So whatever the time of day, pull up a chair, get comfortable, uh, and let's, let, let's dive into something that has been um, rolling around in the back of my mind. I know that I have done a podcast on this before, but it, it seems to burst further and further onto the scene as I interact with people just in everyday circumstances, not really uh, with the, the people I might talk to in, in the counseling setting or the students I interact with at school. But this is always running in the background. And, and I'm sure you probably have heard the phrase, enough is enough, right? I mean, I, the, the, we usually hear somebody see it in a movie. Somebody says, okay, enough. 
and then they they go off and they they are fed up with the situation and and it, they're kind of like marking a point in the sand to say I'm not going any further I'm not dealing with this anymore and and that's pretty much how I feel about this word enough enough is enough about enough <laughs> uh, can I pile any more on there and the reason I say that is that this we're we are tyrannized by the word enough. And the problem with it is not only what the nature of the word is and what it implies and what it refers to, but also the fact that we participate in it unknowingly, more often than not, unknowingly about what it invites us into. And what we have to find a way to do, and I'm, I'm going to zoom to the end and then come back and then fill in the middle, but we have to find some way to disconnect from the conversation of whatever it is, whether it's how I relate uh, in a relationship with somebody or how I do my job or how I, if you're a student, how I do homework and things like that. I have to disconnect from the conversation around um, what is enough and what does it actually mean. So let me, let me start with just the word itself. And, and one of the things about the word enough uh, is I would propose that, that one way to think about it is that it is what I might call a, a contingent word. It's, it's contingent, its meaning is contingent on something else or someone else even. How do I determine if I'm enough of a friend or enough of a boyfriend or girlfriend or enough of a worker or whatever the, the phrase is? And the enough is always built on somebody else's perceptions or opinions about that, whatever that might be. So the word enough triggers into us this relentless, tyrannical comparison between other people and how they how they do things and how they see things other people and how they perceive things namely me and all the other kind of audience of a critical audience that we play to that we don't spend any time polling to see what they actually think or feel it would be too many people so therefore we just do a summary judgment of what it is they think and assume that to be true so whenever I say, I might say, I guess I'll just never be enough, the, the question back to that is compared to what? Compared to what? And, and enough, I mean, how much, really, how much is enough? Interesting story is told about uh, one of the Rockefellers. Now, the Rockefeller family is an old, uh, wealthy family in our country, they were connected to the oil business in, in um, uh, Pennsylvania. And one day, the elder Rockefeller was walking out of a hotel, and he, they, he was peppered with a variety of questions from reporters and other people around. And somebody said to him, because he was a billionaire, and somebody said to him, so how much is enough money? And he said something that was entirely prescient for even our time now. Now, we may not be talking about money. We're talking about emotional uh, economy here. But what he said was, just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. Which means that I am trying to compare myself against a bar of performance, of achievement, of accomplishment, of significance. I, I, I'm comparing myself to a bar that is always raising. And the minute I get close, it rises a little higher. So what, what does that in effect mean is it means that then I am in a constant state of failure, particularly if I'm prone to think of things in all or nothing terms. If I'm not accomplishing above that bar, then <clears throat> I'm a failure. I, not only am I failing, which would probably be a more adequate description, but I go from describing my behavior failing to now my personhood failure. And we think in these nouns like that. We don't think in verbs 
Because failing is a performance issue. I can change that. I can make choices to make changes in regards to that. But when I talk about the noun, a failure, that's gonna that's way harder to change. It's a label that I've already applied to myself that I believe is fundamental to everything I am and that I do and how I'm seen and all the conclusions that are made around me and everything that goes along with that. And so I, we, we have to grapple with the word enough and how often we use it. And, and we live in this state of deficit, which is what John D. Rockefeller was referring to, just a little bit more. And, and so you drag that into relationships, and what you find is people that are always scratching to, to get a little bit more and perform a little bit more, because when they do that, then finally, quote unquote, finally, they will be significant or achieve or whatever the, the important or whatever the, the phrase might be. And this is the, the great illusion that we buy into when we buy into talking about things in terms of enough. And this is, this is where my beef comes in. Because if we're going, <clears throat> let me put it another way. If, if the conversation and the terms of that conversation are going to be built around this word enough, we are doomed because it, we will always be, and here we do a, another comparison, we will always be comparing ourselves to that word enough. What we have to find a way to do is to disconnect ourselves from using that word as a means of describing how things should be. Because what we're implying is that I can finally be enough and then I will matter. Then I will be important. Then I will be significant. Then people will pay attention. Then people will uh, 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 applaud and approve of me and all these other things. And this is literally the dog chasing his tail. There's, there's no way out of that loop because we've bought into fighting this conversation about enough. Now, some people you read and other people, and I, I think this was part of my conversation when I, when I had K.J. Ramsey on the podcast. Some people would say, well, no, you're not enough. So what? Yeah, well, it's not really that easy, really. Because we can say that in the absolute sense, okay? We can say, I, okay, I get it. I give, wave the white flag, I'm, I'm not enough. The problem is, is that is a temporary solution to a world in which we function where it, we are always being compared to whatever enough might be. And when I am going to make the admission that I'm not enough and, and, and resign myself to that, it brings certain kinds of behaviors with it. Like I said, it's, we tend to resign ourselves. And I'll never be enough. The problem is, is we're still buying into the conversation that says, essentially is saying, enough is the measure and therefore I'm going to traffic in that measure in order to establish my importance or significance. What we have to find a way to do, and this is I, what I have to find a way to do is disconnect myself from that conversation and that framing of the conversation so that, <coughs> excuse me, so that I'm not talking about enough at all. I, I got to get a drink. I'm not talking about enough at all. This is not part of the conversation. It is whether or not I have set a standard for myself that is realistic, <clears throat> that takes into account the circumstances in which I am operating, <coughs> the environment I'm in, the people I'm interacting with, there are a myriad of, of uh, <clears throat> variables that I can't control. And 
I since I can't, then using the enough standard sets me up for deplorable failure because I'll I I, I, I it's always moving and I will never get any better. So if I disconnect from that conversation and say, look, it's not about the enough. It's not about that at all. Actually, it's about what do I purpose to do? How much of what I purpose to do is in line with my gifts and passions and how I do things and all of that? And how well am I measuring up, if you want to use that phrase? I I use it with caution. But how much do I does that fit into the nature of what is going on in the moment that we're talking about here? So, for example, if I go into a situation and I'm talking to someone and I look back at it and say, I did a reasonably good job at holding my own, being aware of my limits, uh, being aware of what I can and cannot do. I managed to encourage and support and uh, maybe guide, if you will, in that conversation with this person. And I've accomplished what I set out to do. Good. Yay. Round of applause. I I can celebrate that. I can celebrate, even in a bigger sense, I can celebrate that I'm living fully into how God created me, into the gifts and passions that I have, and those have been brought into another person's life to bless them and even show them the character of Jesus. That's, That's a win, if you want to use that phrase. That's a win. That's good. It's not, well, that wasn't quite enough. And somehow we've gotten this strange notion, particularly, and I think some of it is because of this language of enough, we've gotten this strange notion notion that celebrating and seeing that we did some good things, some things right there that were part of what God had in store for the person that I'm interacting with, that's good. So if I celebrate, am I being prideful? Am I, am I sinning because of that pride? Or am I celebrating and, and feeling and sensing the freedom that I am exercising by living into how God created me and, and what he brought into my life to shape and mold me into the person that met the need of the person right at the moment that perhaps he or she needed it. See, that's a very different process. We're not, we're, I'm not always walking away feeling like I have failed because that's what the language of enough is always about, is I haven't done enough. And since I haven't done enough, I have failed. Even bigger, I am a failure. See, there's only more evidence, evidence to, provide, to support that. And that's... That's why this word enough is such an issue in terms of what I see, you know, in not only in myself, but what I see in, in other people as we have this conversation. The problem is, like I said before, is we live in a culture that is always about comparison. We have been told and bludgeoned and beat up about don't compare yourself to others, blah, 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 but make sure you're enough. <laughs> so... Don't compare yourself to others, but compare yourself to others because that's really the only way that you'll know whether or not you're significant or have any importance in people's lives at all. So here we go on the the hamster wheel again. We're back running as fast as we can and getting nowhere and wondering why the results never changes. Again, I I want to kind of return and, and revert back to First and foremost, we have to get our terms defined and we have to divorce ourselves from the kinds of terms that do not match the things that we say we value. And if I value the importance of individuality and and living fully as God's beloved and and fully living out the passions and gifts that I have been given in, in the relationships I have, 
then good, that's fine. We can celebrate that and say that's good. I don't have to lay over this overlayer that says, yeah, but it wasn't quite good enough. It wasn't, it, I could have done this, I could have done that, I could have done this a little bit better, implied if I was enough, I would have done it better. Have you ever thought that your flaws, your shortcomings, your struggles with the issues that you see going on in your life are the things that end up connecting with people more than you doing it right every time? As a matter of fact, in most cases, if we are able to live in the, under the conditions of grace, we will learn more by doing it wrong than we will by doing it right. Now, I use those terms with a lot of advisement because wrong and right or right and wrong are dichotomous, and that's not what this is about. But that is how we tend to think, and we have to contend with that somehow. So, I, I you know, I, I'm not caught in the cycle even though we live in a world that is constantly comparing somebody else. And I, I ran across this article just recently that commented on the fact that we oftentimes, particularly in the business world, is who is the most heralded, the most uh, uh, advertised, the most marketed, are the people that are rags to riches type stories. They have done everything right. They persisted. They've done the best things. And now we're going to mine that case study to find out the most about how did they make it big the way they did. And if we can replicate it, then we can be big like them too. And the point of this particular article was, is actually the people that have failed and persisted and, and, have, and, and may not hit it up big. They may not be the people that get all the attention, but they actually have more to offer us. If they've spent the time reflecting on the mistakes that they have made and things like that, we might actually have more to learn from them than we do the, the massive success stories that are out there. Not to diminish them. I'm not diminishing them at all. But at the same time, people that are willing to make mistakes and are willing to uh, uh, survive their mistakes without sinking into shame and doom and, and resignation are actually the ones who we have the most to learn from. And as I said a minute ago, have you ever considered the fact that your flaws, shortcomings, issues, struggles, things like that, end up being when they are shared honestly in a relationship that has trust established in it, that they are an invitation into a human interaction, an authentic human interaction, because we're not trying to be something that we're not. We simply are trying to be fully who we are and invite the other person to do the same. Now we've got something. Now we have got something that the world outside, out there, is longing to have the freedom to do, although they don't feel like they, they can do it. And I again, I would say, because of the massive fight that people have around the shame narratives that they are so familiar with that they don't even pay attention to it at all. They do pay attention to it when grace is offered them. And 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 it's like, yeah, but that's too good to be true. That just that that that's not for me. See, and they'll make themselves an exception to the rule. It may be for everybody else, but it's not for me. I've said those words before. Because now I'm immune from the grace that's being offered me because it's so uncomfortable. And yet grace offers us this context for growth, which means that I'm going to face the mistakes that I have, the struggles, the shortcomings I have, and learn to grasp and embrace them. And I'm not trying to make them into something. I am simply trying to accept me as I am. 
the, the, the unexpected, unintended consequence of that is the freedom to move into other relationships with that same kind of perspective. And I think that's a profound paradigm shift that has to be made if we really want people to, or we want to introduce people to the Jesus that is of the Bible rather than the Jesus of never being good enough. Because that's not where Jesus was at. All you have to do is look at the people he interacted with. And you can bet your bottom dollar, even though they may not have thought of this this way, is <clears throat> when, when they were doing their everyday jobs, it was never enough. The things that they were chasing after, the things that they were doing, and they meet Jesus and suddenly perspective comes into, into focus to say, it's not about that. It's about the relationship I have with Christ and ultimately the relationship I have with others that are following Jesus like me. So some food for thought, folks. Like I said, you're going to be hearing this on the backside of Thanksgiving. There will be lots and lots of conversations that you can have going into the holidays because this is a big part of the conversation there too, I might add. And uh, so I, I hope and pray that you've had a good Thanksgiving uh, and that going into the holidays, you take some time to reflect on even the landscape of your own heart and where you stand in regards to that. So a few end of program reminders. Uh, since we have established our presence on Instagram, you can DM your, your questions to me there. Uh, I'm happy to answer them and respond back as often or as quickly as I can. Uh, other subscriptions, you can follow us on the website at drmitch.com, on uh, Instagram at the Psych Monologues, Facebook, Ray.Mitch, M-I-T-S-C-H, and LinkedIn, drmitch, and a new addition to the social media uh, outreach that we have is on Twitter, and that's at Psych, not the, but at Psych Monologues as well. So hit us up. Uh, we'd love to hear from you and continue the conversation. Uh, if, if you're looking for the podcast, you can find us on any of the podcast uh, uh, platforms, including Spotify, Stitcher, iTunes, Podbean, Amazon Music, and iHeartRadio. If you'd like to partner with us to be able to uh, develop and provide silent retreat for, this, for the next generation of Christians, uh, please feel free to uh, help us grow our scholarship fund uh, by your tax-deductible gifts to, uh, for the CCU silent retreats. It's coming up in, on the 30th, here in Colorado at least, is a, something devoted to what's called Colorado Gives Day. And that's just a day for people to set aside to focus on giving to their favorite charities um, and tax-deductible organizations, of which we are one. We are sponsored by uh, 1615.tv, which is our fiscal sponsor and allows us to uh, accept tax-deductible gifts through that. So if you would like to contribute, please go to the website, go to CCU Silent Retreats at the bottom of the page. You'll see a link that says Donate Now. Um, and you can either do that monthly and make a monthly commitment for us to continue to uh, feed and, and uh, uh, build out our Silent Retreats for students. Or if you would rather contribute by check, simply make your check out to 1615.tv and then your envelope, you're addressing it to the same 1615.tv P.O. Box 1777 Castle Rock, Colorado 80104. I think that's it for today. Thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate your time and effort. Please, if you feel so inclined and what you heard uh, is interesting enough um, and inspiring enough, please pass it along to other people that you know or leave a review on Apple iTunes that uh, continues to kind of expand our reach uh, with some of the information and, and uh, the stuff that I'm talking about on the podcast. Uh, but... Help us get the word out so that we can continue to develop our, our silent retreats and spiritual formation uh, activities to support the next generation of Christians coming along. So that's it for today. Thanks so much for joining me. 
Love you. Later. Bye.